Katie Schwab, the director of the W Observatory, and I wanted to welcome you to the final in this series, I Watch Lecture, uh, with Dr. Sten Odenwald. And um, Sten is a research scientist at Catholic University, and he does education for NASA. And as a lot of you know, one thing that we've really been trying to do is use the inner uh, interdisciplinary aspects of astronomy to um, encourage people to enjoy it. And one thing that Sten has worked uh, very hard on is coming up with math problems that use astronomy so you get the whole math curriculum involved also. Um, so he's going to talk to us tonight about cosmology in the 21st century. And uh, we also have his book, Astronomy Cafe, which has the answers to everything. It has like, you know, it, it's almost Christmas. If you're looking for a Bible star of Bethlehem, it's in here. If there's anything he doesn't cover in the lecture, it's got to be in here, I'm sure. So uh, anyway, enjoy the lecture and uh, buy lots of books. <laughs> Well, actually, my favorite book is Patterns in the Void, which probably would have been way more appropriate because that talks about cosmology and my particular voyage through the universe as, as a human. But, you know, first of all, tonight, you guys have all gone through ice storms and rain and, rain and hail. And, you know, I'm not going to do 100 PowerPoint pages on you guys. That's just not appropriate. Um, you know, I'm really conflicted uh, because when I started out in the 60s as, as one of these kids, you know, learning about space because we were walking on the moon and going in with Gemini and doing all this stuff and, and you know, watching Outer Limits on TV. And I mean, you remember, many of you that are, are way old remember what that scene was like. Uh, and I see we have an awful lot of teenagers in this audience and you probably don't remember what that was like. But, you know, it, it's, it's a completely transforming experience, you know, when you grow up with space as something that's in the front page every day. Um, you know, when you read, you know, science fiction written by the, greats, the greatest science fiction writers of all time, and these are things that you can find, you know, at your local bookstore. And, and, and stuff was starting to happen, it was happening. We were discovering quasars, and we were learning about how stars evolved, and, and things like that. It was, you know, I'm not going to say that those were the golden years because quite frankly they weren't. These are the golden years, really. Um, they're golden in the sense that we've confirmed many of the old ideas that we've had in the past and we've been presented with some real new challenges, challenges that quite frankly you and I are not going to be able to solve. But our teenage and young adult kids will be. In fact, they have to. Uh, they and their generations are going to have to resolve these problems, you know, through expenditures of resources, building better telescopes and satellites, being even smarter in mathematics and science than you and I ever were. Uh, and, and so, you know, the universe doesn't care because it's out there all the time. And the way we interact with it goes up every year. I mean, it's even better than the stock market if you want to invest in it, you know. Okay, so, and that's, that's page one. <laughs> now wait till you get to page 72 on this. So let's get started. Uh, for the next three hours, I want to talk to you about 21st century. <laughs> okay, hey, what is cosmology? You know, this, this is the most amusing joke that I, I, I really see. I see this written on bathroom walls. You know, everybody writes jokes about cosmology, you know, and cosmologists, you know. Uh, well, that's my perspective. Actually, nobody really cares about cosmology, but what is it? We've been doing this particular way of looking at the world for thousands of years, and so here it is, you know, before 2500 BC, the ancient Egyptians wrote 500 words on the subject. Wow, that took them a lot of effort, didn't it? You know, and most of those words were written in hieroglyphics, and it took us about 2,000 years to figure out how to translate hieroglyphics, right? But it all boiled down to some interesting ingredients. This was their cosmology. 
It involved a primordial darkness, some kind of a medium, an agent. Light was created, matter was created, and then life was created. It was all done by one god named Amun Ra Keparu. I'm not going to tell you how he did this because that's basically X rated. <coughs> but you can read the pyramid text and you can find out how he did it. Uh, in Babylonian, uh, cosmologists added a little bit of a picture to this. Uh, the Enuma Elish describes how the universe is created, and it uses basically the same elements. Now, duh, who copied whose homework assignment? <laughs> and then we have the Old Testament Genesis. Well, okay, it basically uses the same concepts, but it decides that it is unique and divine, so that's what we use as a Judeo-Christian society. You know, we don't pay attention to any of the other stories which were contemporaneous with the Old Testament. And in fact, there are at least two different stories of Genesis in the Old Testament, but we're not going to worry about that either. So we've added some additional details to cosmology, but basically, you know, 460 words by <coughs> Old Testament, 500 words by the Egyptian pyramid text, and 170 lines of text by the Numen Elish exhausts ancient concepts of cosmology prior to the modern era. Like, you know, it's a universe, it's kind of big, doesn't it require more than 500 words to describe? <laughs> like, wow. Okay, so here we go. From 2500 BC to but basically 1930, we had 5,000 years of nothing new. Nothing. Nobody came up with any new original idea about how the universe was formed, what the universe contained, what it was all about, where it was going. All they did was basically repeat each other's stories over and over again, different languages, but it's the same story. And here we are, 1930. And basically, there's a huge gap between 1930 and today. In a matter of 70 years, we have a massively detailed picture of the origin of the universe, its evolution, where we came from, where planets come from, where stars come from, where galaxies come from, in 70 years. 70 years out of, you know, three, 4,000 years. I think that's been a really productive century, don't you think? All in the 20th century. And now we're entering the 21st. And we haven't even started this story, folks. So I'm gonna talk about first, if you can't talk about, I mean, cosmology is the study of everything in the universe, how it got to be the way it is, where basically it, quote, came from, and where it is, quote, going to. Um, and that's irrespective of political affiliation or religious affiliation. It's just simply a description of the physical world as it's moving relentlessly through time and space. So let's look at astronomy today. That's, if, you, if you don't know where astronomy is today, you're certainly not going to know where cosmology is going in 100 years. OK, astronomy today. We do great things. Here's, here's a, a motion picture of the sun revolving on its axis. We see sunspots. The fact that this is in the far ultraviolet, which is a part of the spectrum we can't see, is irrelevant. But this is basically a placeholder for the fact that we can observe the universe in all the different wavelengths of light that the universe can create energy. Uh, we can see phenomena as they take place in the x-rays through the radio, and we can use that to sort of diagnose, just like you diagnose a patient in a CAT scanner, what's going on with the matter and the forces within them and things like that. And that allows us to create incredibly detailed stories about how things move through space, what they contain, uh, and ultimately by deduction, where they came from. That's a rock. Rocks are boring except if you happen to meet, be me when I was 10 years old. I collected basically every rock in my neighborhood in Oakland, California. I classified them, I put little stickers on them with numbers, I identified them as igneous and sedimentary, and things like that. Now, in Oakland, California, in a suburban environment, uh, it's not known for a rock collecting center of the world, so basically I found three unique types of rocks. That's the best that Oakland could provide. Now, if I tell you that this is a rock on Mars, which is about three feet across at the base, 
and this photograph was taken by one of our uh, telerobotic rotors, that should engender a feeling of, wow, this is what we do today. We go places. You know, humans don't go places. We gave that up about 40 years ago with uh, Apollo. But we now can send our probes to different planets and let them crawl around on the surface and send back pictures like this. I, I, I just get totally chilled when I see this stuff. It's just so great. Here's another picture. Here's an asteroid. Asteroid up close. A big pile of rocks. That asteroid is about uh, 30 miles across. Each one of those boulders is maybe uh, four or 500 feet across. So these are like small mountains. But you know, it's got an interesting texture. We can look at asteroids now. When I was a kid, asteroids were streaks on photographic plates that you couldn't resolve. Now we can go there, look at them, you know, kick them in the butt, and maybe 50 years from now, we're actually gonna go there and set up mining colonies if we want more gold and platinum. Uh, we can look out at the edges of our solar system and see small uh, micro worlds. <clears throat> uh, unfortunately, along the way, we've devoted Pluto to a dwarf planet. It used to be a burly, uh, bustling planet, but we basically kicked it down a couple of stages. Uh, because, hey, you know, the concept of a planet was decided back in the 1930s, and in 70 years, we've learned an awful lot more about what a planet is. And unfortunately now, Pluto doesn't fit that category at all. Uh, stars, hey, you know, for some of the big ones that are nearby, we can actually resolve them. They're no longer points of light. We can actually look at their surfaces. Uh, we can look at sunspots on different stars and things like that. So 21st century astronomy is all about looking at distant stars as though they were just replicas of, the, of our own sun. Hey, we've got 300 planets orbiting, what, 250 stars near us? We're in a different universe, folks. I mean, our kids are, are living in a different world. Uh, in my world, uh, planets outside the solar system were theoretical, and if you were an astronomer giving a talk like this, talking about planets outside the solar system, they'd look at you like you were literally from Mars. Uh, now these are proven, and they're just one more step in the long process of identifying the universe as a living, inhabited place, not where we are the only people and the only life forms. Um, and the next step, now that we've got 300 planets, is that by the time we're in the year 2050, we'll probably have 1,000 or 5,000 planets that we know about, and maybe five of those will identify them as having oxygen atmospheres, which means life, folks. It doesn't mean a stale, stagnant, sterile place. It means living things. So that's something to look forward to in the 21st century. Uh, origin of stars, the evolution of stars, uh, quite frankly, we have kicked the butt on that subject. Uh, we have identified stars in almost all of the stages of their evolution, from protoplanetary disks all the way to supernovae and beyond. Uh, so this is a subject that's no longer theoretical. It's a fact, and we have really gone far with this because we now use this as our yardstick for understanding even vaster systems, uh, even deeper evolutions of things in, in time and space. Uh, and we have a rather disturbing uh, sort of a picture of what our sun is going to do to us in about a billion years. In about a billion years, our sun is going to become hot enough that it's going to evaporate the oceans, and that'll be the end of life on this planet, period. Um, life, as we know it, multicellular started about 550 to 600 million years ago. Uh, in about 550 to 600 million years from now, uh, the temperature on the Earth will be so hot that we will have basically toasted the biosphere because of the evolution of the sun. So we will once again have single cellular organisms. So we're halfway through the period of life on this planet in terms of complex life. That's something that we could never have determined by just basically sitting and, and thinking cerebrally about our environment on this one planet. That's the perspective you only get by looking at our planet as part of a cosmic system evolving through time and space. Uh, galaxies, the next step beyond the Milky Way galaxy is to look at galaxies beyond ours. Uh, this is a scale of the universe that is incomprehensible to humans. Totally incomprehensible. Don't think that because you're looking at this picture that you somehow understand the scale of it. It would take 100,000 years at the speed of light for somebody to travel across this galaxy. And that is a speed that is incomprehensible to us. Um, it, once you leave the solar system, you enter a perspective on the cosmos that is so big that it's almost fantasy. And it's only by religiously thinking about numbers and measure and scale 
that you can keep the whole thing in perspective. That's something that astronomers have learned how to do over the years. Uh, and it's something that we hope might become part of sort of the everyday public, but you know, it, it's, it's so big, it's so huge, it's so vast, it's so impersonal. Uh, basically, it doesn't really affect you, so we tend to ignore it. But the universe is huge, and uh, you know, it, it's something that we, we ought to consider as part of our environment, even though we will never go there in any way, real way. Uh, galaxies uh, do collide with each other. They are close together. Uh, the process takes 100 million years. But once you've trained yourself to think about scales beyond the solar system, all of a sudden the concept of a million years sh sounds short. A hundred million years becomes sort of comfortable. A billion years becomes somewhat old. But a million years is still at the edge of being sort of a comfortable number to an astronomer. Uh, many things happen at the scale of a million years in the universe. A planet like the Earth will form in about a million years um, and, and things like that. So uh, once you get beyond our solar system and our Milky Way, you enter a different arena, but it's an arena that's really not that unfamiliar to us if we work at it. Uh, galaxies come in clusters, and the clusters are dynamic things over the course of hundreds of millions of years. Uh, galaxies, galaxies cannibalize each other, they collide, they form larger systems over time. Uh, and in fact, uh, one of the largest components to the universe that we know about right now is not the uh, luminous matter uh, that we feel so comfortable with in the form of stars and planets and stuff like that, but it's actually something called dark matter. Uh, there is way more dark matter in the universe than there is luminous matter, which is sort of chilling. Uh, because as an astronomer, you've spent your entire life and entire centuries of thinking about the universe in terms of where stars are or in terms of where galaxies are. And you look at those as sort of being the important ingredients of the universe. That's not what's important in the universe any longer. Uh, dark matter is. It's the largest concentration of ga gravitating stuff uh, in the universe. And fundamentally, we don't know what it is. We have no clue what this stuff is. But it's way more important to the universe uh, than stars. Uh, dark matter is what controls the evolution and the destiny of our universe in a very real way. Stars and luminous matter is just an epiphenomenon. It's just basically almost dust, as you will, would call it. Um, we get to be really good using computers to do calculations. Uh, those calculations increasingly look very much like the uh, That represented uh, a course of about uh, 500 to a billion years worth of evolution of basically matter expanding with the universe and uh, pieces of it sort of collapsing into smaller clumps as uh, the process goes. Uh, our supercomputers these days are the essential and critical ingredient to advancing astronomical knowledge. Uh, beyond just the observations that we can make, which are often very crude, uh, supercomputer calculations allow us to use basic physical principles, uh, apply them to the way matter moves, and to watch the entire grand ensemble evolve through time. Uh, we then change a parameter and watch how that evolves through time. And the objective is, to make the final result look like something that we've actually observed. And once we've made our model look like something that we can actually observe, then we look at the numbers that went into it and try to understand why those numbers are the way they are. And that is the modern approach to astronomy, working with huge amounts of data to figure out how large collections of matter in the universe evolve through space and time. And we can thank the commercial uh, computer gaming industry for that capacity. Those of you that like to do computer games and high throughput graphics interaction type stuff, man, you guys have saved astronomy in a way that you can never really understand. Because you have driven the industry to develop faster and faster processors. And those very same processors are now used by astronomers to create models like this, which used to take a thousand years to run to do a calculation and now take a couple of hours. Now that's a real savings in time and effort. Uh, the other thing that we try to look for beyond clusters of galaxies as we move out into space 
is understanding how galaxies themselves and even the first generations of stars formed in the universe. Uh, this is an artist's view of the first generations of stars that formed in the universe uh, billions of years ago. Uh, we don't know what the actual story is. Uh, current data in cosmology suggests that it was a fairly dramatic period uh, that, la that came and went very quickly within the span of maybe about 100, 100 million years. Uh, and after that was over, uh, we had lots and lots of stars that went supernovae uh, and then populated the universe with heavy elements, things like carbon and oxygen and nitrogen. If it hadn't been for that early generation of stars, we literally wouldn't be here today. So we have this timeline of the universe that stretches back 13.7 billion years. Uh, it goes from uh, today's universe with very familiar things and it rushes all the way back to literally the Big Bang itself. Uh, the universe goes through many stages uh, in this process. Uh, if we go uh, forward in time, you have a hot universe cooling into a very cool and cold universe where things condense gravitationally, form stars and then galaxies and then build up structure. Uh, and so this is sort of an idea that we have. And we try to assemble data that lets us explore these different periods. Um, the, uh, the period 300,000 years after the Big Bang uh, is the period which the uh, COBE and WMAP satellites uh, are able to explore by looking at the cosmic uh, radiation background uh, and uh, basically analyzing it to death. Um, we have essentially built up a very nice consistent model of the evolution of the universe from the Big Bang to the present era, uh, which is a comfort to many astronomers. Uh, it's also a comfort to uh, uh, many people who are devoutly religious, because we basically say nothing different than what Genesis says, but we say it in a different language. Uh, the universe did start out with a finite beginning uh, in time. Uh, the twist that we add to this concept is that time itself actually came into existence at the Big Bang. Uh, there was no pre-existing time. Uh, which, which is a subtlety that isn't covered in any ancient texts that uh, we know of. Uh, the other thing that we add to this equation of modern cosmology uh, is the fact that uh, we don't live in a universe with uh, stars and luminous matter being the dominant stuff. We live in a universe in which dark energy is the most common thing, dark matter is the next most common thing, and the stuff that we call stars and atoms dust, and black holes, and neutron stars, and white dwarfs, and cosmic rays, that's 4% of the stuff that causes gravity in our universe. So the big question that we have as we uh, enter the first decade of the 21st century is, what is dark energy? What is dark matter? Because in cosmology, if we can't answer those two questions, then we are only dealing with 4% of what the universe is all about. And that's kind of embarrassing, wouldn't you say? <laughs> I, mean, I, I mean, if you, if you ignore 96% of everything in your life and only concentrate on 4%, I mean, that's kind of sad. <laughs> uh, you know, so we're gonna try to make up that deficit in the 21st century. We don't quite know how, but uh, so what do we need to know? Um, we run ourselves up against something of a brick wall. Uh, these very same observations that we've used uh, to explore how stars and galaxies evolved through time and space, uh, techniques that we've used to map the locations of literally hundreds of millions of galaxies in the universe, and I'm not joking on that, uh, we have cataloged literally hundreds of millions of galaxies with some of the more modern surveys that are going on. Uh, and uh, the estimate is that there are probably about, oh, maybe 50 billion galaxies in our visible universe. Uh, so we're sort of at the less than 1% level, but it can only get better. Eventually we'll have a survey and a catalog of all of the galaxies in our universe. And that's not an imaginary concept. But even with that, we're only cataloging that 4% of matter. None of that is telling us a whole lot right away about what dark matter and dark energy are all about. So how can we get a handle on that? 
That is the most pressing question in cosmology in the 21st century, and it is literally the only question in cosmology. We're not debating whether or not there was a Big Bang. That's gone. Uh, in the 1960s and early 70s, when I was coming up, you know, when you're writing essays in freshman astronomy on cosmology, you know, you always had to do the essay, you know, is the universe finite or is it infinite? You know, is the universe going to collapse or is it going to expand forever? And is Big Bang cosmology better than steady state cosmology? And so the poor professors in the early 1970s would get endless essays by very earnest students writing comparative studies of Big Bang versus steady state. It don't work in the 21st century. It's only the Big Bang. So now the question is not whether it's the Big Bang. That's a given. The question is, what is dark matter and what is dark energy? So those are now the essays for 21st century college students writing their stories about astronomy. Uh, guaranteed, 100%. And we need to know what these two things are. We still need to understand how it is that the first generations of stars were formed. We have a whole bunch of competing ideas about what that first generation was like. You know, after the Big Bang, this is, you know, we're talking several million years after the Big Bang happened. The universe expanded and cooled relentlessly. Um, eventually, uh, the hydrogen gas cooled to the point where it was just regular hydrogen gas, and eventually that started cooling more until it clumped gravitationally. But beyond that, we don't really know the story of how the first generations of stars, and galaxies for that matter, were actually put together. Um, what, we, what we thought before was that it was sort of a top-down process. That you start out with huge clumps of matter that fragmented smaller and smaller and smaller until you got down to stars. That doesn't seem to be what the data suggests these days, but we don't know for sure. Instead, what it seems to be from these supercomputer calculations is that you start out with very small clumps like these uh, first generation stars, they become large clusters that then get absorbed and collide with each other to make bigger clusters and bigger and bigger clusters. So that's sort of the bottom up approach, starting from small things and working your way up the ladder to big things. Uh, and the, the neat thing about that idea is that we can still see it going on in our universe today. We see galaxies cannibalizing each other. As they collide, they form even more massive systems. So it seems like the universe has this predilection for taking small things and cannibalizing them into bigger things, not in the bigger things fragmenting into smaller things. But we don't know that for sure. We'd really like to know that. And in preference, we'd really like to observe it by looking at these very distant, very infant-looking things in the universe uh, to clear up that, that mystery. Another thing that we don't really understand in cosmology is what is space. Now, <clears throat> come on. It is so obvious. You know, space is the volume in this room. You know, if you want to be a brainiac about it, the volume of this room is in three dimensions. You know, up, down, sideways, and whatever. You know, one, two, three. But why is that? You know? When you think about it a little bit carefully, how is it that this sort of dimension of the world is sort of controlling the way matter works. You know, what's the connection? You know, why is it that I can't do a fast turn and wind up in a fourth dimension? Really? But I can't. In fact, there's not a single stitch of matter in the universe that we know about that can do that particular trick. So there's something about the dimensions of space that are intimately related to the way matter operates. And we fundamentally don't know what that relationship is. And that's what Einstein said. When you look at it in the mathematics, we don't really understand what space is. And according to him, you really shouldn't use that term at all. It's really vague. Uh, but then he said another thing. I mean, that's even more interesting. Space-time, now we can think about space and time sort of combined together, uh, is another name for the gravitational field. So somehow, the gravitational
gravitational field, you know, we all think you know, the sun produces one and the earth produces one. I'm producing one right now, so are all of you, so is that chair, you know, that cockroach walking across. Everything produces a gravitational field. But what this is saying is something even more subtle than that. If you were to turn off the gravitational fields of everything in the universe, space and time would flash out of existence. Now, this isn't some bizarre speculation, you know, pulled out of his fantasy world after having a couple of bottles of beer, or wine, or vodka, or whatever Einstein drank. This came directly out of his mathematics, right? Correct. You know, no human interpretation. And the way that happened was he had a symbol that he used for the geometry of space and a symbol that he used for the gravitational field produced by matter. And in the mathematics, those symbols were identical to each other. They were an identity, which means gravitational fields are equal to space time. So that's why he proposed this idea. He proposed general relativity in 1915, and after thinking about general relativity for 15 years, he decided that this is what the world really looked like. Space and time are another name for gravitational fields. Uh, we have a modest experience with fields. You know, there's electric fields, you know, static electricity, you know, and they produce fields and stuff like that. Electric positive and negative fields. Our favorite one is magnetic fields. <coughs> thing around it that attracts males and you know stuff like that and coins and whatever else. But what he's saying is that these are all things that are embedded in space. Uh, space itself is its own field. And we call it gravity in another name. Uh, he also said, and I, I'm using Einstein all the time, but you could just as well poll every other physicist. Uh, who works in this subject today, um, matter is not fundamental. Now, he didn't mean that, you know, that chair is just a chair, and, 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 and that if you looked at it, you know, it's made out of atoms and electrons and protons and quarks. He wasn't referring to the fact that you could take any kind of a chair and turn it into quarks. He was talking about something else. Uh, something else a lot more fundamental than that. He was saying that there is nothing fundamental about matter, no matter at what scale you look at it. Whether it's a chair, whether it's an atom, whether it's a quark, these are not fundamental ingredients to the universe. Matter, according to John Wheeler, uh, recently deceased, uh, must be built out of the gravitational field itself. Uh, this is sort of a perspective that physicists have today, uh, largely unchallenged by any observation. That when you look at gravity and gravitational fields, and you look at matter made out of quarks and electrons and protons and all that jumble of stuff, uh, there is at some scale where these things are the same things. That somehow matter is a part and created out of pieces of the gravitational field itself. And putting it poetically, it means that matter is made out of time and space. Now that's a whoa, whoa idea if I've ever heard one, okay? But that is the basis of literally all fundamental physics today. That is sort of the, 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 the concept that they carry with them when they create all of these theories that you might have heard about. A fundamental belief is that matter itself is not fundamental. That it is somehow a construct of the gravitational field of the universe itself. And so now we can ask, well, why is it that we live in a three-dimensional world, but matter can't somehow spin into the fourth dimension? Well, if matter is made out of the same stuff as three-dimensional space, it can't go anywhere else. <laughs> it's always in three-dimensional space. It can't somehow go places where the rest of the space isn't. So now we have a comparison when we talk about cosmology, the progression of ideas. Uh, we're going to talk about old tools, not necessarily out of date or, or value uh, less. 
and we're going to talk about new tools which uh, astronomers tend to use and cosmologists use uh, in the 20th, late 20th century and 21st. Uh, the old, quote, tool used to be God, but now we replace that with the laws of nature. I'm not making any judgments on this. It might sound like I'm being sort of flippant. <coughs> but if you look at any text on modern cosmology today, you will not find God in it. <clears throat> and everything that we talk about that the laws of nature do used to be things that the divine text said that God did. <clears throat> and that is not a value station statement at all. It's just a statement of if you read the text, that's where it goes. Now, we also have in the old tool category uh, the concepts that the world is made out of water, earth, air, light, and dark. Light and dark played a really big role, not only in the Old Testament, but in many of the early cosmologies. They really got into the concept of light and dark. Okay? Today, we've replaced those with matter fields. All of those things on the left-hand side can now be translated mathematically into what we call matter fields. Uh, electron fields, quark fields, gluon fields, uh, electromagnetic fields, magnetic fields. Things have changed. Our language has changed. Space and time. Those used to be important categories, and for most people, they still are. We keep those fundamentally separate from each other all the time. Today, in physics, they are called space-time. They are an amalgam that are so completely tied together that we cannot disentangle them in any physical phenomenon that we look at. <clears throat> Creation. Well, is that an old tool or concept? I don't know. Uh, but we've now replaced it with a whole raft of ways of basically bootstrapping the universe into existence out of nothingness. Uh, quantum physics, relativity, vacuum tunneling. Uh, but these aren't speculative ideas. Every time you go into a dark room and turn the light switch on, you instantly bring into existence billions of particles that never existed before in the entire catalog of the contents of the universe. So creating something out of nothing is a lot easier than you might think. Relativity, endless jokes about relativity, but it works. End of story. Vacuum tunneling, what the heck is that? Uh, it's the idea that if you have an energy barrier between two states, in quantum mechanics, an electron can actually gain the energy that it needs to get to the higher state without actually having the energy that it needs to get to the higher state. It just tunnels. Again, not a speculative concept. Your cell phones, uh, your Walkmans, your TVs would not work unless tunnel diodes which have been fabricated for about 40 years, actually work exactly along these principles. Uh, the concept of vacuum tunneling, going from a state that doesn't have enough energy, that is dark, to a state which has the requisite energy, which is light and contains particles, is a fundamental concept in modern cosmology. And it's believed to be sort of the driving mechanism that literally bootstrap our universe into existence out of literally nothing. And that's that's what we use as the tool to do that particular trick. Uh, 21st century cosmology is, is what a college professor once called a dog's breakfast. It's a dog's breakfast of concepts that amazingly are organized in an interesting order. Uh, you'll probably not recognize any of these terms, uh, but represents about 30 years of uh, literally thousands of research papers done by theoreticians in figuring out how one state leads to another state leads to another state. Ultimately, you get down to us, which is our universe. But as you see, there are some different ways of getting there. Uh, for instance, uh, you know, think of solving the equation for the variable x. The equation, you would think, only has one solution. In cosmology, that would be our universe the way it is as we experience it. But in mathematics, you also have equations which have an infinite number of solutions. Uh, and so the question is, which of those infinite solutions represents our universe? And how is that selection made? If there's only one solution, then we're it. 
case is closed, we can all go <coughs> and you know, go to the Bahamas and we won't have cosmology anymore. But if we have a landscape where there are an infinite number of possible universes with all these different types of physical constants and physical phenomena, then there has to be some way of selecting out of that infinitude the kind of a universe that we live in. The solution to that is called the anthropic principle. And that's an observer participatory type of a solution. We live in a universe that has weird constants for gravity and the speed of light, because if those constants were different, we wouldn't be here to observe. Sounds like a circular argument, but it seems to be coming very much in vogue in astronomy, rather in cosmology these, these days. Um, uh, string theory and other theories like that tell us that there are literally billions and billions of possible solutions that give us wonderful unified theories of how the universe works. But there's nothing in those solutions that say which solution is us. Only the fact that we're here selects a particular universe. So all of a sudden, we become important, and, and, and this is a completely philosophically bizarre kind of an idea, that we become important in the existence of our own universe. Very, very hard to wrap the mind around that. And it's such a new idea, it can't possibly compete with ideas that are literally thousands of years old. Other ways of building universes, uh, in some types of models, you can start with absolutely nothing called ex nihilo, starting from nothing. In others, you start with something, ex quisipa, or whatever. It's never very good at Latin. Uh, but either way, you wind up with our universe, and there are at least a thousand research papers by theoreticians with lots of mathematics that you or I don't understand that promise that there are ways of going down this particular travel uh, to get to us. All of this is theory. The question is, these are all theories. These are all mathematical models. These are all models that, quite frankly, how do you figure out how to test any of these ideas in cosmology? Uh, we're only living in one universe. And that universe is, by its own definition, excluded from all the other universes that might be out there, which are totally unobservable, totally. Uh, some of these theories say that those universes exist in other dimensions. Some say that they exist in dimensions that are separated from us by some chasm that we can't, we can't uh, broach. Um, so observationally, all of these ideas are interesting mathematical exercises. But as an astronomer uh, you know, who has built telescopes as an amateur you know, who works with satellite data measuring you know, the brightness of distant galaxies, I need measurable things to carry my view of the universe to the next step. I don't need more theories. So that's the challenge of 21st century cosmology, uh, is to try desperately to whittle down all of these possibilities for what the universe is like at huge scales uh, into a smaller collection of things that seem to meet you know, the observations a bit better. Uh, when you do that, you are really doing science in the, cri in the critical, in, in, in the sort of canonical sense of doing science. Proposing ideas, going out measuring, comparing the measurements with your ideas, and then moving the process forward. The problem has been, quite frankly, uh, since the development of string theory in 1982, uh, is that the theories have literally run away with the data, not only within the physics community, but also within the cosmological community. Uh, you will have endless numbers of books published to become New York Times bestsellers uh, by theoreticians who are advocating different corners uh, of this new 21st century cosmology. Uh, some talk about uh, multiple dimensions for the universe. Other talk, others talk about brain theory. Others talk about superstrings. And they all promise to sort of explain these things uh, to you or I. And I, frankly, I put you and I in the same category. Because fundamentally, I am not a physicist who is trained with that level of mathematics and understanding how to build a good theory. And so I rely on other ways of judging things. My way is to say, these are great ideas, but how do they compare with what we know or what we could possibly know in the next 100 years about the way our universe is put together? 
And unfortunately, you know, the well-intended discussions by Stephen Hawking and by a variety of other, uh, you know, Lisa Randell and, and others, uh, you know, it sounds like too much science fiction to me. There's a lot of wonderful mathematics behind all of this discussion, but it, it just doesn't resonate in me as an astronomer. And it's not because I'm an old school astronomer, hey, I'm 56 years old, but what the heck. You know, it's like, you know, if you're going to change the way you think about the world, uh, you need to develop sort of the Missouri idea, you know, show me. And right now, the idea of, of, of there being 11 dimensions to the universe, the idea that there are brains rattling around in the bulk, you know, these things really sound wonderful. And in the 1960s, when I was reading science fiction, I would have given my, my, my left arm to read more of this stuff. But it doesn't speak to me today as an astronomer. But what I am waiting for are the answers to some interesting questions. Which came first? Yeah. <laughs> Everybody asks me, my next door neighbor across the fence, you know, we're mowing lawns. He said, yeah, I know you're, you're, you do cosmology, but you know, what came first? You know, what, what? what is this? How does this work? All right, what came first? Chicken or the egg? Chicken? All right, uh, chicken or the egg? We got space time on the one hand and we got matter on the other. What came first, space time or matter? All right, let's take it another step. Uh, space time is a field and matter is a bunch of elementary particles. Okay, which came first, space time or the elementary particles? All right, let's take another step. Uh, space time is just another name for the gravitational field. Uh, elementary particles are a bunch of matter fields. All right, which came first, the gravitational field of the cosmos or matter fields? All right, so which came first, space or matter? Well, the answer is, they both came first. Because, look, they're all part of this unified thing. Matter is a bunch of fields, and gravity is the ultimate field. So, the belief that we have in physics today is that somehow those two things, those two concepts, those two physical phenomena are fundamentally unified together. That matter, as weird as it looks, is just another name for a piece of the gravitational field that looks a little bit different than empty space. We don't quite know how that came about, but that's what unified field theory is all about. And there are various species of unified field theory. There are brains, there are strings, there's quantum gravity. But we don't know which of those three work because the way to test these things requires technology that's at least 500 years away. So for the next 500 years, and I pull that number completely out of whatever, uh, you know, it, the point is that it took the international community to build the next generation of particle accelerators in CERN called the Large Hadron Collider. Uh, the United States, through the infinite wisdom of Congress, decided that we were not going to build the superconducting super collider in the late 1980s, even though we invested over $5 billion in dredging, in, in tunneling through uh, the bedrock of Texas to build the first segment of this. We decided to advocate this whole area of physics. Our physicists and graduate students are now going over to Geneva to use the accelerator over there because we are all manically interested in where this question is gonna resolve itself. Is there a unified field theory? Is there a way of combining matter and gravity together <coughs> into a bigger picture, a more fundamental picture? Well, when we get that, the answer is going to be that both of these things came first, and because of that, they both murdered the concept of time. <clears throat> All right, so there's a solution to the chicken and egg problem. The answer is they both came first, and they both murdered time. So the question became moot. Uh, physics in this century is going to be beyond exciting. It's going to, it's going to set the direction for the way we think about the world and the universe uh, I don't want to sound like, like completely bizarre, especially since I only have six more minutes, you know, but it's going to set the stage for the way we think about the world for the next thousand years. Um, what do we need to know or what do we need to prove? Uh, why are space and matter different? We're going to, at least at the beginning, we're going to use the Large Hadron Collider in Geneva this year to start that process. Uh, we're going to confirm, we hope, the existence of the Higgs boson, which gives mass to matter. 
Uh, we're also hopefully going to find superparticles, which are essential in just about every description of unifying gravity and matter that we know how to create today. Uh, and these are pictures of, of the large detectors. And yes, that is a human being standing there within the tunnel of the Atlas detector, uh, which is going to be important in detecting the Higgs boson and other things. Uh, here's a simulation of what we hope the uh, Higgs boson is going to look like when it flashes into existence and decays and the flash of particles. Uh, how does gravity really work? We don't really know. Gravity is such a weak force that we can't put it in the laboratory and watch it interact. Uh, and we have to look at cosmological scales to even see it do anything interesting. Uh, so we're going to build, uh, here's a, a gravitational wave detector, uh, which is going to measure gravity waves. Uh, we don't know if they exist, but all of the mathematics uh, says that gravity waves exist. And if they don't, then all of a sudden uh, Einstein is wrong, and we're back to square one and figuring out how gravity is and what it does. Uh, what is dark matter? Uh, the Chandra Observatory, which is now in operation and has been for many years, uh, is uh, basically mapping out uh, how galaxies and hot gas move in the universe and are using that as tracers of where the bulk of gravitating material is. And in a number of cases, they've been able to find uh, large collections of dark matter that are controlling the motions of uh, galaxies and, and hot gas. So Chandra helps us indirectly detect dark matter, but not directly. But hey, if you hear something quacking in the forest, it's probably a duck uh, or somebody doing a really bad imitation. Uh, where did galaxies come from? Uh, uh, when did galaxies form? Uh, the Hubble still seems to be masterful in letting us probe the more distant universe and see the youngest galaxies. And that's going to continue uh, at least for the next five years. Um, when did galaxy clusters first form, which are the largest structures in the universe? Uh, the WMAP satellite and the recently uh, to be launched uh, Planck satellite uh, are going to let us explore that question in even more detail. Uh, when did the first uh, stars form? Uh, the Spitzer Space Telescope is helping us understand that problem and the Webb Space Telescope to be launched in, uh, in about eight years. Uh, we'll move that even farther. Uh, to the point where we're actually able to observe the first generations of stars that formed in the universe. Clearly a cosmological issue. Uh, what are gamma ray bursts? Uh, we don't quite know. Uh, we haven't observed enough of these. Uh, we need to observe thousands of these things and zero in on them as targets with optical telescopes. Uh, the GLASS satellite, which was launched uh, last year, uh, is going to help us do that. Uh, what happens near black holes? The SWIFT satellite is an X-ray uh, observatory. Uh, which helps us look at uh, the signatures of matter that's falling into a black hole uh, within our Milky Way galaxy. So we'll learn a lot more about what happens uh, under those conditions. Uh, how are gravity waves created? Uh, the LISA uh, satellite interferometer to be launched by NASA within the next 10 years uh, will search for gravity waves in space uh, caused by supernovae and distant galaxies. Again, if we understand gravity waves, we understand a lot more about how gravity works, and that gives us greater confidence that we understand other things that depend on gravity, like the evolution and origin of the universe. What is dark energy? Uh, the premier subject in astronomy, uh, the SNAP mission, uh, is basically going to look at supernovae in galaxies that are literally billions of light years away. And by doing that, it's going to measure the rate at which the universe is expanding and give us a better handle on this uh, energy which is causing the universe to expand at an accelerated pace. Uh, something which uh, is really quite scary if taken to its ultimate conclusion. Uh, if this acceleration continues unabated, uh, uh, millennium and eon after eon, uh, basically it will rip apart uh, space and time and matter. Now that's kind of a dismal thing, isn't it? Um, uh, will expansion accelerate forever? The Destiny Satellite, uh, that is an acronym uh, that I can't possibly tell you what the main words are in the acronym. Uh, basically, we'll also look at supernova at an even greater and deeper slice of the universe uh, to pin down uh, the rate at which acceleration is changing in the universe. Um, a look beyond 2015. <laughs> Everything that I've told you, these are satellites to be launched before 2015. Have I ever actually told you anything about the rest of the 21st century? Um, how do we go from the beginning of the 21st century uh, where dark matter and dark energy are the biggest ingredients and to which we have almost no handles uh, to the end of the 21st century where surely 
Surely by the end of the 21st century, we'll have a better handle as to what these things are. Um, and that is a kind of a picture that I can't wait to experience. Unfortunately, I'll probably check out of the world by 2030. So there'll be 70 years where progress of science will take us in directions that <clears throat> absolutely no astronomer can predict today. Now, has this entire <clears throat> lecture been sort of a bait and switch? I mean, you, you came here to learn about 21st century cosmology. I told you about the first 15 years. But I want you to think about other things, too, that are also ingredients of 21st century astronomy and represent a direction in which we seem to be relentlessly moving. You know, no matter if you know what dark matter is or dark energy uh, or the fundamental nature of matter, there seem to be things, trends, that we can see that stretch back 100 years. And if we extrapolate to the next 100 years, seems to be pretty unequivocal the way these things are going. <clears throat> the primeval void was swelling, whirling, and vaguely growing, a boiling maelstrom out of which emerged the foundations of space, light, and matter. This is part of a uh, religious uh, creation mythology. Fundamentally, with the last hundred years of physics and astronomy, and probably with the next hundred years of astrophysics and cosmology, we will not be able to better that description. Okay, and this is a description that came into the minds of people living uh, hundreds of years ago. <clears throat> but more recently, uh, Heinrich Hertz in the last part of the 19th century. If we wish to understand the universe, we have to imagine things concealed beyond the limits of our senses. And those <clears throat> invisible confederates, as he called them, are the things that give structure to the things around us. Now, no better description of fields and the properties of empty space have ever come up since Heinrich Harris uh, penned those words. That the way things are that we experience uh, rely intimately on things that we cannot directly experience with our eyes and senses. Physicists have become masters in probing empty space, uh, seeing virtual particles come and go, particles that have no real physical existence but which steer of uh, the motion of matter and energy and field in the universe. We've really become the masters of understanding the invisible gravitational field and the way we navigate within our solar system and beyond. Invisible things rule in the universe, and understanding how these invisible things work is really what astronomy and physics has become in the 21st century. And finally, ask yourself whether the work has enabled you to walk about into a hitherto unknown world if the answer is yes, what more do you want? Uh, written by the artist uh, Kandinsky. And this is the idea that, you know, look, scientists and cosmologists and astrophysicists are going to give you increasingly more detailed pictures about how things are put together. Have those details helped you navigate physically and spiritually through the world? If they have, then what more are you expecting from this entire avenue of intellectual pursuit? If they haven't, well, maybe you haven't been really paying attention quite so much to the way things are going in science in the last 100 years. So this is a statement that, at some level, we have to take responsibility for in the pursuit of science. We have to take our own personal responsibility for keeping up with this magnificent intellectual <laughs> adventure that we've been on for literally thousands of years. And, and so that is basically how I'd like to end this talk. 21st century cosmology is going to be not so much about the universe and what we know about it, but what we make of it as individuals. And uh, I'm really hoping that uh, we continue to make an awful lot of it, because fundamentally, it is a magnificent story. It's humongously detailed. And at every level, it shows the importance of humans and living things within this grand scheme, even as much as every religious Genesis story that you've ever read. Uh, it is a story 
even 20th century <laughs> cosmology shows that we don't live in a random universe. We live in a universe that's relegated, that's, that's dictated by physical laws, the movement and behavior of invisible things, and we are all a part of that particular tapestry. Okay? So I guess that's, that's sort of the end. I mean, think about this as sort of an exploration of where we're going, uh, and uh, maybe uh, an encouragement to sort of keep up with the story at whatever level you feel comfortable and be very surprised at the end. Uh, any questions? And thank you very much. For